start the PhD defense and uh, of the alleged, so I'm sorry for my <laughs> Spanish accent, which is non existent, Alej Plasolas Esteban, I tried to uh, say it correctly, um, who will present today um, his thesis uh, entitled The Journal Across Multiple Scales of Human Mobility. And uh, this thesis was completed uh, under the guidance of uh, uh, Dr. Maxime Lenormand, who is there, and uh, Jose uh, Javier uh, Ramasco. And the committee uh, today will, uh, uh, will be shared by myself, my name is Marc Barthelini. And uh, on my uh, right is uh, Chiro Catuto from the uh, University of Torino and the uh, Foundation. And on my left, the secretary of the jury, uh, Javier Borghi. And um, so the, uh, basically, you will have a presentation, uh, maximum one hour, let's say. Then you will have uh, questions. And after the questions, uh, we will uh, uh, then uh, deliberate for uh, deciding, uh, uh, for giving the mark about your thesis. So uh, during the presentation, there are no questions, so we get the question now. Mm. So uh, I think uh, uh, I said everything, so the, uh, it's your turn. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Um, this thesis, as well as this presentation, is organized to provide you an overview of the different scales of human mobility. And on the way, I will give you insights on how we can measure human mobility, how we can model it, and how we can use it for better understand cities. But let me start like in the usual way, so the motivation, so, and it's a bit silly because we don't need a motivation for doing science, but still, uh, you know, why we should, should study human mobility? Because we move and we make pollution, we move and we purchase cities, we move and we generate flight delays that cost millions of dollars, and even more, the high scale of, of mobility of, of today uh, facilitates the spread of pathogens. If you are still not convinced, in the final part of this talk, I will talk about a few applications, more uh, applications on, on human mobility. But in fact, the interest in studying human mobility is much older than many of these like, new concerns. One can identify in George Rubenstein, one of the first to try to study human mobility and try to outline a series of laws or, or general patterns on the migration in the UK. Basically, he saw that uh, females were more migratory than males or that those local inhabitants of the rural areas were more migrant than those in the urban areas. However, uh, Rabenstein and many others that came after him during the 20th century were strongly limited by the uh, scarce data available. So basically they only had censuses, surveys, and regarding mobility, uh, usually the information accounted for the movement from home to work. And this is not enough to have a broad perspective of human mobility. Uh, thanks to the digitalization that occurred in the 20th century, we nowadays uh, have many types of data, and this has kind of driven us into a more uh, an era of data-driven modeling of human mobility. And the start of this era is more or less identified with these uh, two papers. Uh, in the first, they studied the movement of individuals uh, through, the, um, through the displacement of banknotes, but the problem here is that at the end they were studying the movement of banknotes and not the movement of individuals, because the movement of one banknote could include the displacement of many individuals, and it was not clear this separation. Two years after, by studying uh, mobile phone data, uh, they now yet provided a more a realistic picture of human mobility, because in, in this case, yes, you, uh, mobile phone data allows you to track individually each, each individual. But these are just two examples of the kind of data we have today, and here, for instance, I show to you uh, some, uh, some trajectories obtained with mobile phone data, but we have also, for instance, GPS that are many times included in cars. So here you can see the trajectories that, that start in Florence in red and the trajectories that start in Pisa in blue. And we have also the so-called uh, location-based social networks that are those social networks that usually compare with uh, geotagged information. So there is an interaction in that social network and there is a pair of coordinates of where this guy or this girl was. And here, for instance, you see how we can track individuals after having visited Paris on the top and after visiting uh, New York City on the bottom. So now we have a lot, a lot of data and this has led to, to this more uh, data-driven modeling of human mobility and we have seen the appearance of you know, a huge literature. So we can, for instance, uh, uh, understand the infrastructure through Twitter or we can uh, know which, are the social which is the role of the social demographic characteristics in human mobility. 
or we can even try to understand better what should be our concerns with this, uh, pr with the privacy, with this like individual data uh, running around. And this is from the, from the side, let's say, of more data analysis. But there has been also works on the side of modeling. So, for instance, human mobility is important to model the spread of epidemics and also to better understand the traffic and the congestion in, in urban areas. So, more or less with this like general framework. Uh, I will present to you like my five uh, uh, contributions to the field. Uh, first of all, I will start, uh, start with the worldwide scale of movement, uh, starting the movement of, of tourists. Then I'm going to the country and city scale, in which I will try to show you so how we can model and which models work better to understand uh, human mobility. And finally, I'm going to the city scale, in which I will talk to you about uh, the hierarchical organization of cities, uh, how delays emerge in these uh, massive events, so you have a lot of people <coughs> in a reduced amount of space, and then when they need to go back home, they, you, it is a mess. And this, in this, an example of this would be like concerts or demonstrations. And finally, uh, in, a more, in the more applied work of this thesis, I will show to you what would be the outcome of implementing a tall policy around the city of, of Barcelona. So talking about the, the worldwide scale of, of movement, so tourism is one of the main reasons behind it. So uh, tourism generates a lot of, of, of millions of dollars and so on, but on the other hand, it also affects the local environment, it can affect the local inhabitants, and so on. So it's good to understand uh, how tourists are moving. And in many, many cases, the traditional data sources, the, the census and the surveys are not enough. And first of all, with this work, we wanted to probe if uh, we can use location-based social networks to better understand uh, tourism, and on the way, we'll provide a measure of attractiveness of, of touristic sites. So uh, to do so, uh, we've used uh, location-based social networks and Twitter because they have a main, despite it may, may have less statistics than mobile phone data, for instance, it has an advantage, advantage that is the, the worldwide scale. So uh, with mobile phone data, you usually buy a data set from a telecom company and you don't really have a coverage or in a country. But with location-based social networks, you can download a data set that has worldwide coverage. And this was, for instance, used here to quantify the flows between countries. Or additionally, also the, the diffusion after having visited cities was used, was used as a metric for city influence. And uh, we wanted basically to continue this, this idea to measure uh, the touristic site attractiveness. And to do so, we downloaded a, a data set from Twitter of 59,000 users, and we will evaluate the attractiveness of these uh, 20 touristic sites. And we will evaluate this attractiveness by studying the residence place of these users. So first step, uh, assigning a cell of residence to each of these users. So we desolate the world using a width of cells of 100 per 100 kilometers, and we assign the cell of residence to the most common cell of each user. So once we have a cell of residence for each individual, uh, I will show you just the two basic metrics used. One is the radius, which is just the average distance from the touristic site to the uh, residence place of the visitors. And this radius is normalized to take into account the different world topology. And then we have the, the coverage, which is basically the number of unique sets of residents of these visitors. And we complement the, complement the picture with a country coverage, which is basically the number of unique countries of origin of these visitors. So let me just show you this ranking. So as you can see, so many sites around the world appear in this top 10 out of 20. But uh, the Taj Mahal, the Pisa Tower, and the Eiffel Tower are, are on the top. Switching to the coverage by cells, so this is the number of cells of the, of the visitors. Uh, you have again the Pisa Tower, the Taj Mahal, and the Eiffel Tower, but the Grand Canyon appears on second position, which is not strange, but it's surprising at least. And then you have the, the country coverage, in which now the Grand Canyon has disappeared, and you have, for example, Giza, which means that Giza is able to attract uh, visitors from many different counties. So what happens with the, with the Grand Canyon that uh, is here, but is not here? So basically, here I show you the countries of origin of the visitors of the Taj Mahal and of the visitors of the Grand Canyon. And as you can see, while well, the Taj Mahal is able to attract individuals from all around the world, most of the visitors of the Grand Canyon come from the US. And that is why it has a high cell coverage, so it attracts people from many places around the US, but it's not able to attract persons from many countries around the world. So just let me su just summarize this part. So uh, overall, or according to our metrics, the Taj Mahal, the Pisa Tower, and the Eiffel Tower are the most attractive sites among the 20 we have studied. Uh, we believe this is a, a so this kind of proof so is a first proof of the usefulness of location-based social networks to quantify touristic flows. 
And uh, possible extensions would be, for instance, to add the penetration rates and try to see if we can uh, mimic the real touristic flows of, of regions. And in fact, it's a work we are currently doing. And we could also do a similar framework to quantify migratory flows. So uh, now that I have kind of explained uh, how we can measure human mobility, I would like to, to talk to you about how we can model it. And during the 20th century, many different approaches were developed to try to understand how many people move from one place to another. But overall, those, those approaches and those different variations can be summarized in two main groups that have been fighting like for years. You have the gravity approach and the intervening opportunities approach. So on short, the, in the gravity approach, the main variables are the population of the origin, the population of the destination, and a decaying function of the distance between them. On the other hand, for the intervening opportunities approaches, what you have as main variables is again the population of the origin, the population of the destination, and SIJ, and not the distance. And this SIJ is just the number of opportunities between the origin and the destination. What this means is that you can have an origin and a destination that are far apart, but, but if there is nothing in between, it's very likely that the flow between both will be high. On the other hand, if you have an origin and a destination close together, but there is a half of opportunities in between, it's very likely that the flow will be lower. And in this work, we wanted to differentiate very well between the approaches or the probabilistic laws that give rise to, that, that, that relates these variables with the constraints that we use to finally generate the trip between the different regions. And we wanted to do so because in previous works, uh, this separation has not been clear and the comparisons between the models have been done un in unfair conditions. And unfair conditions, I mean level of constraint. You could understand the level of constraint that we introduce into a model about information. So we can put more information or less information. So you have an if you have an unconstrained model, you only put as information for the model, for each census unit I or for each spatial unit I, the population of this spatial unit. Then you have a production constraint in which, aside from the population, we fix the total number of outgoing trips. And this is fixed from the real data. So we have the empirical data and we can fix it. Then the attraction constraint, basically we have the, the, the population of the census unit and we have the total number of trips entering in each census unit. And finally the W constraint in which we have the population of the, of the sense of the spatial unit and we fix at the same time the, the total number of trips incoming into a census unit and outgoing. Basically, we are going from less information that we are introducing into the system to more information. So now that we have the, the clear the approaches and the constraints, what we will compare is the commuting network, so uh, the number of people going from home to work in six countries and two cities. And we will we'll try to see which models reproduce better these commuting networks. And, but to see how good a model performs, let me just sketch to you the, the main metrics used. Just remember that for all these metrics, uh, they are done comparing the empirical flows, so the real network, the ground truth, and the modeled flows. So first we have the, the common part of links in which we compare the topology of both, net, of the, both networks. So you take the, the topology of the real network, the topology of the model network, and you see how many links they have in common. Then you have the common part of commuters that is a comparison by weight. So we compare how many commuters go from each uh, census unit I to each census unit I, J. And finally, you have the common part of commuters by distance, which is uh, basically a comparison of the commu commuting distances. So just let me, let me go to the, like, the main results. So here you have the CPC, so the common part of commuters. Here you have the CPL, the common part of links. And here you have the common part of commuters by distance. Just keep in mind that this is closer to one if the models are performing better. And regarding different approaches we tested, for the case of the gravity, we tested an exponential decay and a power law decay in red and blue. And for the intervening opportunities approaches, we tested the Schneider approach in yellow, the radiation standard in purple, and the radiation with a free parameter in green. And here you have the level of constraint. So unconstrained, production constraint, activity constraint, and W constraint. So to summarize, we go from less information to more information. The first like, kind of obvious observation is that as we put more real information into these models, all of them perform better. Okay. And the other general observation is that the, the gravity approach with an exponential decay in red 
you can see it is on the top for all metrics. Despite with some situations, I can think, for instance, here in the common part of links with double constraint, okay, the radiation gives a similar message. And the other like interesting information is that here the difference is not so, so high. And this is because the intervening opportunities, uh, it's better at modeling the large commuting distances. And that makes the difference between the different approaches uh, like less strong. So let me now summarize a bit this. Uh, yes, the gravity approach with an exponential decay performs better than the rest of the approaches, but in some cases the differences are not so large. And overall, and like the main message of this is that we have established a fair framework to compare these models by separating the approach and the constraints, so that the amount of information we are introducing in, in each one is the same. And uh, yes, the, the other limitation, if you want, is that we are modeling commuting. So this, mo this comparison could be extended to model other types of mobility. So um, now I, I, I have explained to you how we can measure human mobility and how we can model it. And from now until the end of the talk, I will talk to you about how, how we can use human mobility to better understand cities. And I like to understand cities like those places in which the best and the worst of mankind take place. So on the one hand, you have the opera, the museums, the architecture, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, you have social tension with tourists, you have economic segregation, you have pollution, you have congestion. So uh, I guess here our, our goal as a scientist is like to keep the good and try to understand which are these bad outcomes, why, why they, where they come from, and how we can mitigate them. And first of all, I will talk to you about uh, urban structure, so the organization of cities. And in completely how we can understand the organization of cities thanks to mobility. And in fact, the structure of cities has been tackled from many different disciplines. So you have urban planners, you have economists, you have uh, even physicists. And in this, from the side of the urban planners, most of the dichotomy has focused on, on, on the, most of the research has focused on the dichotomy between urban sprawl and compactness. Usually urban sprawl is, you know, these kind of cities with low uh, density uh, uh, residential areas, with the small house, the garden, the dog, but you have to take the car to drive a lot of kilometers. And on the other hand, you have compactness that are those cities with uh, high density of population, high density of jobs, a more developed public transportation system. And in the US, for instance, the usual example of this thing is New York City. But uh, on Europe, many or much of the European cities are also an example of this uh, compactness. And the research on this uh, side uh, has focused on two main directions. So one is developing more and more complex indices of sprawl, and then, thanks to these indices, try to understand which is the role of sprawl in the transportation <coughs> in cities, in the pollution in cities, and in the health. However, so this, many of these works have one strong limitation, that is that they focus on static data. So they can take the, the density of population, or they can take the density of jobs, but they are not taking any picture of the dynamics that are happening in cities. And our goal will here, or what I will try to explain to you, is how we can uh, analyze, analyze better the dynamics, so how people is moving in, in cities. And one, already one idea to try to complement these static measures well, is that researchers started to use these uh, new sources of data. Here, for instance, they analyzed the, the tabs, the tap in the, in the subway of London to, uh, to unveil the existence of different polycenters and a hierarchical organization of flows. However, uh, so the, the main limitation here, if you want, is that they analyze a subway data that uh, is, not, uh, is not in many cities. And moreover, the movement of individuals in the subway might not be representative of the whole mobility in a city. On the other hand, they have also used uh, mobile phone data to try to quantify this activity in cities. For instance, with mobile phone data, one can uh, draw like these activity maps for each time of the day. So you are already having an idea of the dynamics that are occurring in these cities. And here on the right, you can see that they also found that there is a scaling with, uh, so the number of hotspots or activity centers scaled sublinearly with the population of these cities. This study was done in 31 Spanish cities. And as a follow-up, um, they, they studied, they, so after quantifying these hotspots, they studied how was the structure of the commuting network in terms of if the flows were mainly between hotspots or between non-hotspots and so on. So with all this framework in mind, so what is our goal here? First, uh, measure the hierarchical organization of cities, try to go beyond these uh, hotspots, non-hotspots dichotomy, 
and try to go a bit further and not focus only on commuting but on all type of trips and all this in the wider range of cities as possible and we were lucky because uh, Google uh, let us uh, his data and we use it uh, uh, Google location history data that accounts for the movement of around 5% of the world population that are those users that opted in to share their data for research purposes but here so we did not deal with like individual mobility but of aggregated flows between cells of one square kilometer per, per one square kilometer for of around one square kilometer so we have uh, cells in each city and we have flows between these cells first step we we'll measure the hotspots in the same way the previous works have done <coughs> and to do so we will uh, use the same method which is basically you can plot the, the cumulative fraction of the total outflow as a function of the cumulative fraction of nodes and you get this blue curve which is known as the Lorentz curve to have an idea this Lorentz curve is a cer certain measure of inequality so if it is in the diagonal that means it, the, the distribution is, is like equal and the more it goes away it, the more unequal it is and the, to identify these hotspots basically we take the derivative in one one and the crossing with the x-axis and these nodes here will be the hotspots the main intuition behind here if you want is that the more this is uh, curved in the end the more the less hotspots you have because these hotspots are accumulating a higher uh, rate of the total flow but I, I, I already said that we do not want it to go again into this hotspot non hotspot thing so the next we can after we have identified these hotspots we can take them away from distribution and compute again the Lorentz curve and do again this derivative and okay we have a new level of hotspots that are those nodes here and we can do this again again and again until we have assigned a hotspot level for each of the city cells so we have each city cell and each city cell has a hotspot or activity level now let's take a look to how these hotspot levels look like in a map here you have uh, cities of around 10 million inhabitants so Paris, Bangalore, and Los Angeles and on the bottom you have cities of around 5 million inhabitants with Alexandria, Santiago and Sydney the other pattern that you might uh, maybe, may, maybe see is that from left to right uh, we go from cities in which the different hotspot levels are more close together to cities in which there is a higher mixing between these hotspot levels so the next step would be to quantify this hierarchical mobility and by now what do we have? Uh, cells in a city which a hotspot level and flows between these cells so let's propose a metric to quantify this hierarchical mobility and when I talk about hierarchical I talk about entities in a level that only interact within themselves or with the above and below levels so the first step is that we will encapsulate this cell to cell flows into hotspot level to hotspot level flows and this, is, this information is aggregated into a matrix of flows but let me just put you an example in the entry one, one of this matrix you have the total number of trips that occur between cells of level 1 and cells of level 1 in the entry one, 2 of this matrix you have the total number of trips that go from cells of level 1 to cells of level 2 so once we have this matrix and this matrix is normalized so that we can fairly compare cities with different population or different activity and so on so once we have this matrix it's quite, quite straightforward to develop a metric to quantify the urban hierarchy and, and we propose the flow hierarchy which is basically the, the sum of the elements that I already highlighted in yellow so you have the, the diagonal, the elements in the diagonal and the adjacent ones so basically these entries are the total number of trips between hotspots or this of the same or consecutive levels so this kind of a structure so now let me show you how this the value of this uh, flow hierarchy phi looks like in a subset of cities so it is continuously distributed it is in some cities it is quite high so 0.94 means that 94 percent of the trips in that city occur between hotspots of the same or consecutive level and the other thing is that you can already see that the, the value of this fee captures more or less the general structure of this matrix so the higher it is the more the flows are concentrated next to the diagonal and the other interesting finding that by the way is not so so surprising is that there is a relation between this fee and the spatial uh, distribution of these hotspots so here we had on the left on the previous map uh, Paris and Alexandria and as you can see and they, they have the highest value of fee compared to the other cities so they are on the left side of this plot on the other hand here you have uh, uh, Los Angeles and Sydney and they were on the right and now they are on the right side so have lower values of fee so the higher the hierarchical city it is the more um, close together are these hotspot levels 
thanks to the, to the nice coverage of the data we had, we were able to compute this flow, flow, flow hierarchy in around 200 cities around the world. And OK, it is again continually distributed. And we also find like a continental trend. So if you look here, you can see that uh, the cities in yellow and red are among the most hierarchical and are African and American cities. No, African and Asian cities. Then you have European in black. And finally, American in blue and Oceanian in green that are the, among the less hierarchical. So trying to recap, I've proposed to you a, a metric to, to quantify the hierarchical mobility. And yes, cities show a wide range of hierarchical structures. But the next step maybe could be, um, does this hierarchical organization of mobility can be related to how people move in cities? Maybe the, the transportation modes they use? And, the, and we will test this uh, possibility by studying first US cities, in which we have you know, homogeneous boundaries definition, and we have an homogeneous gathering of urban indicators on many topics, and so on. I show you first here the model share of uh, commuting trips by public transportation as a function of this flow hierarchy fee. As you can see, there is a trend that seems to point out that in those cities that have a more hierarchical structure, <coughs> then there is a higher use, use of public transportation. And in the, in the thesis, I also showed that there is an inverse relation in the case of the car. So in those cities that are more hierarchical, there is a lower use of car. So in, if cities more hierarchical, there is a, high, a lower use of car, there is also a lower emission of pollutants, it could make sense. And the fact is, the, is that yes, so here you have the emissions of NOx as a function of this flow hierarchy uh, fee, and as you, as you can see there is a trend signaling that those cities with a higher fee also have a lower emission of pollutants. And this also, I mean, this relation is also found with different pollutants. <coughs> so, let's go for the, like, the, the last jump. If there is a relation between this uh, flow hierarchy fee and the emission of pollutants, could it be a relation between the, the, um, the flow hierarchy fee and the health in cities? And the answer is again, yes. So here I show you the death rate by ischemic heart stroke as a function of the flow hierarchy fee. And as you can see, there is a tendency that those cities with a stronger hierarchy uh, have a lower death rate of ischemic heart stroke. And this illness, I mean, we have not selected this illness at random, but because it has been uh, proven that this is related to the pollution. OK, we close the picture. But, but not, not quite, because the first we found after is that the, this correlation only appears with the death rate. So it does not appear with the incidence. And the incidence should also be correlated. And moreover, this incidence of the ischemic heart stroke should be correlated with the concentration of pollutants, not with the emissions. So there, there is like a, a final step we are missing. And this final step is that maybe uh, in those more hierarchical cities, people have a better access to healthcare facilities. And that is why we don't see this correlation in the, for the case of the incident, but we see it in the case of the death rate. And here I show you the average distance to the closest hospital as a function of the flow hierarchy. And you can see that indeed, uh, it seems that in those more hierarchical cities, um, there is a lower distance to the average hospital. So, uh, for those illnesses in which the attention to the hospital is or, or to the healthcare facilities is crucial, uh, that can make the difference. So that's more or less all. So we try to extend these correlations at the worldwide scale as much as possible. And we were able to do it in the case of the pu public transportation, and we were able to do it in the case of emissions. Unfortunately, uh, there is no homogeneous gathering of urban indicators in the center of health at a worldwide scale, so we were not able to you know, extended the, this whole picture to a, to a city <coughs> of, the, of our right scale. So let me just close this, this part. So I've shown to you, or I've proposed to you a metric to measure urban mo hierarchical mobility. I've shown to you how this differs in the different cities. Uh, I've shown to you that this hierarchical mobility is correlated with the transportation, the health, and, and the pollution in cities. And finally, like the, maybe like the, last, the next step would be to develop a model to understand how these hierarchies emerge in cities. However, when we want to have like a more uh, realistic picture of the delays in public transportation networks, we many times need to bring in the public transportation infrastructures. And this is what we did to study a very concrete case that is those massive events that are pretty common in many cities. So you have a concert, or you have, uh, have a demonstration, and at some point during the day, 
um, the, the event uh, the, the, uh, the event ends, and all of them need to go back home back home at the same time. And in many situations, the public transportation system cannot cope with such a peak of demand. And in fact, <coughs> this is not a, a, like an example we made out of nothing. So basically, these are a couple of informations that you can see on the news of the concerns of the public transportation managers of the delays after two concerts. And here you can see a uh, huge delays that appeared in a, <coughs> in a stadium in, in the capital of Spain, Madrid. So what we will do to, to study these massive events. So first of all, we'll develop a model, so a simplified model if you want, uh, to mimic the movement of individuals through the public transportation system. The main ingredients of this model is a multi-layer network, so we have the different transportation lines in different layers, and a working layer in the bottom, in which individuals can, let's say, work with infinite capacity. And then on these transportation lines, there will be vehicles running through them. So you have the, the movement of the vehicles that move according to the frequency, to the real frequency of the timetables, time and there is a limited number of individuals that fit inside. So basically, individuals can move freely through the working layer, they can go into a transportation line, and then they, they need to do the queue to board into a vehicle and move through the line. That is like the, the broad picture. So the final ingredient for these individuals is, first of all, the origin and destination that they will follow, that we extracted it from Twitter, and are based to the movement from home to work. And they have a local adaptive routine. That, on summary, means basically that they go to a stop, they see the congestion, they reevaluate the route, and, and, the, and they go that is stop by stop until they reach their destination. So, this is the main picture of the model now. Let me just sketch it like the, the main method methodology to, to evaluate these events. So, first of all, we will evaluate an event by including in, a, in, a, in the same location an increasing amount of individuals I. And at the same time, there will be individuals moving through the background from home to work. And the main metric we are interested in is the average delay. So for these individuals in the event, what is the, ta the delay they, they suffered by, by the congestion, which is measured basically as the real travel time minus the travel time expected without congestion. And the main scaling function that we were interested in is this average delay as a function of the number of individuals in the event. In the case of uh, eight cities, uh, we will study, uh, the eight cities we have studied, we'll study 100 different locations in each of these cities. And I say in the case of cities because at uh, first we studied lattices, because we physicists like, love to like, go into simple systems and try to understand uh, what is going on. And we, we selected regular lattices in which we could even draw some analytical solutions. Here I show you the average delay as a function of the number of individuals for a 1D lattice and for a 2D lattice. And in dots you have the simulations, and in lines you have the, the analytical solution we were able to obtain. So the first you can see is that there is a scaling, and that this scaling depends on the network dimension. So for the case of, of a 1D lattice, uh, you have a linear scaling with the number of individuals in the event. But in the case of a 2D lattice, you have a scaling of 0 0.5 with the number of individuals in the event. This is quite easy to understand, so basically you have only in a one-dimensional lattice, you have only one direction towards your destination, but in a 2D lattice, as you move from the event, more and more uncongested alternatives appear, and that leads to a, to a scaling of 0 0.5. We were able to extend these solutions by an approximation to prove that this scaling of 1 over D uh, takes place for n-dimensional lattices. But this is, this is only the case if our um, lattices have an homogeneous capacity. So each node has the same frequency and uh, the same number of individuals that can fit, in, fit inside. And that basically means that let's ca if we, you count the number, the cumulative number of nodes that increase within a certain radius in a 2D lattice, you obtain a scaling of this shape. So they go to, to the square of the distance. And if these nodes have a constant capacity, you end up having a cumulative capacity that grows with the square of the distance. Okay, but what happens if the capacity of a single node escapes linearly with the distance? Then you have this scaling plus this scaling, and the cumulative capacity ends up scaling to the third of the distance. And even more, what happens if the, the scaling of the capacity of a single node scales to the square of the distance? Uh, then you have to take everything into account, and the scaling of the accumulated capacity scales with a power of four. So now let's see how this looks like in a simulation. So basically, 
Uh, here I show you the average delay as a function of the number of individuals for the scale, the linear scaling of the capacity, for the linear scaling of the capacity and the scaling of the cumulative capacity to the third. And uh, in green, the scaling of the cumulative capacity with an exponent of four. And as you can see, there is not again this scaling of zero five, but uh, it tends to go to, z go to one third in the case of in this case, and it tends to go to one fourth in this case. So the main, like the main <coughs> message you can take from here is that we need to reformulate network dimension in the case of networks with limited capacity if this capacity is heterogeneous. But let's go now already into the results for, for cities. And uh, here you have the scaling of the average delay again as a function of the number of individuals for four locations in Paris. You can see that the, there is a scaling and that uh, these exponents change from location to location. That could mean that each uh, location event has a different uh, local has a different local environment and a different local dimension, and that leads to different exponents. And if we plot the distribution of these exponents in the 100 locations we studied, you can see uh, this kind of this distribution. Basically, it is centered around 0.5, as you could expect from a transportation network embedded in a 2D space. But it is also uh, like there are also exponents close to 0, 0.3 and close to 0, 0.7 which already means that the local environment uh, of these networks is quite heterogeneous. But uh, I have already said that we need to reformulate network dimension, so let's go into that. Uh, with the measure we propose is to, to, to exactly the same I was explaining to you previously. So we will measure the growth of cumulative capacity as a function of the distance, so we uh, increase the distance from the event and we measure what is the cumulative capacity. And the growth of this cumulative capacity will give us this measure of network dimension that in this case, yes, takes into account the, net, the, the network capacity. And here I show you on the left an example on, of, on how we can compute this, uh, this dimension. So you measure the, the growth of the capacity as a function of the distance and you measure this exponent. It's important to know that here we are talking about uh, persons per second. So it's the number of individuals that fit inside each line divided by the frequency. And if, if our results in lattices were, were, I mean, were true in also in cities, what we would observe is that the average of this dimension should give us the scaling of this delay also in cities. And here I show you the distribution of the <coughs> inverse of this network dimension. And you can see that it's fairly comparable to the previous one. It is centered around 0 0.5 and is mostly distributed between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And finally, we try to close the, the picture by doing a comparison of the uh, scaling exponents in these 100 locations and the inverse of this local dimension measured in this way. And it's still, I mean, there's a bit of noise because uh, that we are already comparing simulations and the empirical networks, but in, in general, there is, there is a certain trend. So let me summarize. Uh, we have, like, first of all, I have proved that the, the inverse of the dimension governs the scaling of the average delay. I have shown to you that these exponents uh, change from city to city and that we need a reformulation of network dimension if the capacities are heterogeneous. And there is also records that I have not been able to show by reasons of time, so basically we also find a scaling in the case of those individuals that are traveling in the background aside from those in the event. And finally, I, I still feel that it would be necessary to close this picture to analyze uh, the real recovery of some real event to see this scaling. So, um, I've more or less gone through this presentation, so from the larger scales to the, to the smaller scales, but kind of also you can feel that I've gone from, let's say, less applied words to words in which the application is more and more closer. And the last word I will present to you is the one, the more applied by far, and you are already almost in policy implementation. And in this work, <laughs> we, I will study the, the possible outcome of, of, our, of implementing a cordon toll policy around the city of Barcelona. So the first question is why a toll policy? So the first thing is that many cities are implementing it. Here you can see the ring around uh, Estocolm. And the interesting part here is that is the example of Madrid. So Madrid, for instance, um, implemented a, a restriction in the entrance of cars 
without doing a proper transportation analysis of what would be the possible consequences of implementing such a restriction. And then there was the elections and the major change, and now he's thinking on taking away this restriction, but surprise, again, without doing any proper analysis of what would happen if we uh, take away this ring and what, what are the consequences of pollution. So, on this context, our idea here is, okay, so let's provide a framework so that people can uh, have an idea of <coughs> what happens when we implement these public policies. And in concrete, we will analyze two different independent uh, scenarios that are the ring in red and the ring in blue. Uh, they, might, they might look random, but uh, they, were, um, they were a proposal by the City Hall of Barcelona in the context of an European project. So it is one around the main core of the city and one around the whole city. And the main methodology we used in this work is a combination of mobile phone data and an agent-based model named Matsim that is much more complex than the one I have presented in the previous work. So basically, you have, it is individual based, so you have a series of individuals and they, they need to perform a certain number of activities during a day. And they need to be at certain time, time at certain places in the world, in the, in the city. And they use the transportation infra infrastructures to move from one to another. And there is a, um, there is a, a function or a score, a score function that says how good they are moving between these different locations and they change the, the position, so there is an iterative process in which they change the route and they see if they can, in, they can increase this score and they stop when all the scores of all the individuals are, the, are let's say, the maximum. And the, the key here is that these activities and the time they should start are extracted from real mobile phone data. But uh, before going into the analysis, there is a <coughs> calibration process. So we need to model the, the many, many parameters that this model has like to uh, match the reality, so match the real mobility in the city. And here, by real mobility, we used the model split by the model split in two regions. So you have the model split, so the rate of trip performing each mode, compared to the rate to the model split given by a buyer model. And they are and in, in these two regions, so the first area and the, and the province. And as you can see, the relation between both is quite similar. As a further um, comprobation, we checked the traffic counts in a few roads after the calibration process and we saw that the agreement between both was good. So in many cases, the, the traffic counts between the model and the reality were matching. And we could trust this, this calibration. And finally, so the, the main, so the, we provide results at three different perspectives. One is an aggregated perspective, so uh, which is the reduction of car trips. One interesting finding here, if you want, is that uh, if you apply an afternoon toll, you have a reduction of, of cars in the afternoon, but you have also a reduction of cars as light reduction in the morning, because people are taking the car to the city, but they don't want to pay the toll in the afternoon. So they already leave the car at home uh, during the morning. Then we, are, we, we went through a district uh, perspective, so uh, how was the change in travel times for the different districts, where, which were the more affected districts, and finally, uh, a an outcome or, or an anticipation of what would be the increase of public transportation passengers in the case of implementing this both toll policy. And this is a very important information because the, the managers of a public transportation system can say, okay, I increase this frequency or I increase, increase this capacity and so on. So just closing the, the, this final work, so we have provided a framework to, to fairly evaluate the outcome of public policies and we have seen also that new sources of data are very important for these kind of things. And finally, um, maybe as a, out of a curiosity, I would like to, <laughs> to perform a study trying to anticipate what would be like the social contestation of application of carbon toll policy that I understand it's not included here. So, um, just for concluding, um, in the first work, I've shown to you how we can use location-based social networks to measure uh, tourism. Uh, and I have shown to you that the Tamahal, the Pisa Tower, and the Eiffel Tower are among the most attractive sites. On the second world, I perform a comparison of different approaches and models how to, to understand how many people commute from one place to another. And I've shown to you that the gravity law uh, performs slightly better than the rest. Uh, then I've presented to you a metric on how we can characterize the hierarchical structure of cities. And I've seen to you that there is a correlation with, of this metric with the um, the model sharing cities, the emission of pollutants, and the health. 
then I've gone into the, the, what is the effect of these massive events in, in cities, and I've shown to you that there is a scaling, and it can be shown that this scaling goes as the inverse of the network dimension, and more into a um, public policy-oriented work. I've shown to you what would be the outcome, or I've presented to you the framework to understand the outcome of public policy. All of these works may have like extensions. So for instance, here, you can uh, add the penetration rates of each country to quantify the real touristic flows, or here again, you can like go beyond this community mobility and quantify all the mobility. Here, uh, we already don't know how these hierarchies emerge or why some cities have a stronger flow year, a stronger fee than others. Uh, here, we should certainly measure this scaling in real cities to, to observe it and try maybe to add a parameter to our model to fit this real uh, recovery. And finally, here I, I already said that it would be nice to see uh, what is the, the, the what is the effect on the on the people of implementing such a tall policy. So, just uh, like uh, general conclusions, uh, this is brings together many many different disciplines. I've gone from data science to geography to urban planning to transportation planning, and all through the lens like of physics. And I hope it's just another proof that we physicists have a lot to say beyond you know the traditional topics, the quantum thing, and and so on and so forth. And that, and that it, it mainly highlights the, the role of studying human mobility because it impacts the society and because we have a lot of things to say on human mobility and it has a lot of applications. And, and, and I've done many of these works using new data sources and I hope it's also proved that, that new data sources are very important. For instance, the, the metric we used to, to measure the hierarchical mobility, mobility of cities was extended to a worldwide scale. Well, in many cases, those explore indices that the urban planners do focus only in the United States because it's where they have data. Or for instance, the demand that we generated with mobile phone data in the tall policy thing uh, would have cost many, would have cost uh, almost a fortune to do a survey for all these guys to see uh, where do you go, where do you go, and, and that thing. And basically, uh, the last two words also are a bridge between uh, like more fundamental research and more applied research, and certainly we should move forward into you know pushing both at the same time. So fundamental research, okay, but also like try to help the society to to improve. So like cities, for instance, are too important to give it on the hands of urban planners or economists. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. So we now proceed with the uh, question uh, and answer session. And uh, um, we will uh, start with question by the secretary Javier. Uh, Mark, first, uh, congratulations to uh, Alesh for the presentation, for the thesis, for the work, and to the supervisors, for the patients, for the guidance. Uh, so, having said that, I enjoyed the presentation and I enjoyed bringing your thesis. And I have many questions. I don't know uh, the president how much time uh, is uh, giving to me. Okay, I would like to limit myself to a uh, few questions. So I will just go in order, uh, yes. let's say, the order of the, of the thesis and the, and the presentation. To me, one of the questions, um, so in the, in the case of the, the tourism through the lens of data, yes. Um, I have two questions here. One, let's say, is uh, methodological or technical or whatever. Um, to what extent some of the results that you are showing in, 